Good morning and welcome to another live Hit the Mark Sabbath School lesson. My name is Philip Del Rocco and I am going to be your host this morning for what is going to be undoubtedly the fastest hour that you are going to spend this beautiful Sabbath day. So we'd like to welcome everybody. If this is your first time viewing, welcome to the Hit the Mark family. We're just so excited to have you. If you have an opportunity, just drop us a line. Let us know how you found out about Hit the Mark and where you are viewing from. I am sitting in the seat that is normally filled uh, by Curtis Hall. Curtis is down in Tampa, Florida today. Uh, he's going to be doing a sermon in the, uh, where is it? In the First University SDA Church. If you'd like to see Curtis's sermon, it starts at 11 a.m., you go to YouTube, you can uh, just type in First University SDA Church. Their page will come up. Uh, you can view that at 11 o'clock. If not, you can always go and view that later on. Team, I'm going to do uh, some really quick housekeeping before I get into the introductions of this incredible panel that I have been gifted with uh, this morning. So uh, if you do not have a hard copy of the, of the lesson plan for this quarter, uh, there are two ways that you can go on and you can view it uh, at ssnet.org and absg.adventist.org. And you can go on, pull that up, and you can follow along with what we are uh, what we are doing today and certainly what we're doing for the rest of the quarter. Uh, you can follow us on Instagram if you have not yet done so. Uh, it is hit the mark underscore Sabbath school. Thank you to Elise for all of the work that she does, not just on on the Sabbath day with the page, but as she does during the week, she's got some great content on there. So please, if you haven't done so, go on and like our page and tell others uh, to go on and like our page. Team, every week that we are doing this brings us that much closer to uh, the excitement is just building up because we have very soon our hit the mark spiritual summer this year we're going to be deeper than we have in other years, if you can imagine that. Uh, mark your calendar, September 13th through the 15th. Listen, I can tell you all about this. Words really cannot describe, though, adequately what it is like to be part of this summit. So please, if it's possible, get there for the summit. We're going to be right down outside the airport in Atlanta, Hartsfield. Uh, Friday night, we're going to have the, uh, the sing-along with uh, Luther Washington, it's our inspiration, and it's going to be absolutely fantastic to really bring us into uh, bring us into the summit. So please, if you have an opportunity, just register, come and join us. It is going to be absolutely life changing. I can tell you, it changed me the first summit that we had. I don't know about you guys, certainly changed me, and just builds the excitement for every year to come back and spend with everyone. So, uh, so thank you all. For that, for those of you who had that have registered already, thank you all. We look forward to uh, seeing you. Of course, everything that we do uh, requires money. Uh, the ministry requires money. What we do requires money. You have been so faithful in your giving uh, to this ministry, to what we do. So please continue to do so. If you are moved to do so, here is uh, the link that you can go on for our fundraiser. You can also do it through uh, through Cash App, you could do it through PayPal as well, and so we uh, we just thank you for uh, for doing that. We have just amazing, amazing viewers, so thank you all so much. Any of the information that I have mentioned, or something maybe that I have failed to mention, uh, you could just email us, um, send us your questions, send us your suggestions, your prayer requests. Certainly, the email address is below, as you can see, and uh, and we look forward to hearing from you. So thank you. Thank you everyone for tuning in. And now I get to introduce this incredible panel that we have this morning. I'm going to start, uh, I was going to start with Esther, but she is uh, dropped off. So I'm gonna start with Darian. My brother Darian, I, I was mentioning to you, it has been, I don't, it maybe has been a month or two months since you and I have actually served together on the panel. So this is a huge treat for me today mm -hmm. to have you part of this panel. You were in our neck of the woods right here in Atlanta last week. So tell us how you're doing. Tell us about that briefly, Darian, how the experience was in Atlanta. Yeah, I'm so glad to be back. It's been at least a month <clears throat> since I've been off. Uh, we had Women's History Month last month and my wife is the over that 
So we had a lot of stuff going on at the church. Um, and then last week I was at Myron Edmonds men's conference in Atlanta. It was absolutely fantastic. Just a reminder about the importance of getting in community. Obviously that's one for men, but mm -hmm. whatever, whatever uh, God has called you to being in, that's what we see in Acts 2. It wasn't just a weekly meeting at church. People broke bread together every single day. So just a reminder of the importance of that, but uh, glad to be back in the house and glad to see the comments uh, of folks you know, familiar faces that we're looking forward to seeing in September by, by God's grace. So, Amen, Amen, Amen. It's great to have you. It's good to see you again, uh, Brother Darian. My brother Eric in uh, Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, good morning, Eric. I think I saw there was, I know we had an enormous amount of rain here during the week uh, in Atlanta. I think I saw that you guys had uh, some pretty uh, pretty heavy rains up there. How are you doing? How are you doing this uh, this beautiful Sabbath morning? Uh, good morning, everyone. We're doing well. We had a big storm last night. Um, Ohio mm. got hit hard, but Ohio's <laughs> tough, as that's we know. Ohio's <laughs> tough, and we're gonna come through. And it's just it's just so glad. To, I'm so glad to be here with everyone. And they were mentioning in the chat, um, welcome home, Darian. It's good to see you again and to sit with you once again. And just have everyone, Esther and Phil, it's good to be here with you. It's good to have you. It's always good to have you, brother. Last but not least, certainly, is uh, Esther, uh, Esther Green, our resident scholar. Esther, who was also uh, in Atlanta last week, she got to teach Sabbath School Live, which had to be a treat for everyone that was there. Esther, how are you doing? How's the weather up at Andrews University? And tell us a little bit about how uh, Atlanta was. I'm doing well. Good to be with you guys. Um, happy fourth anniversary. I was, um, yeah, I was home in Atlanta. It was so good <laughs> to get all the loving and the hugs and just everything. It was wonderful. I didn't realize that I hadn't taught Sabbath school since about 2018. And wow. uh, I, I was like, oh, this is different. I had to find <laughs> and, and reconnect with those old muscles. And then, of course, because I've grown a little bit in terms of how I teach, I had to also figure out how to bring those elements in. So it was a very interesting time, but I love my little all nations and I love the new church home. I think I will just be a member of all nations, just wherever I am in life, throughout life. And I'm just thankful to be back home safely. I have some kind of sickness or Maybe, I'm hoping it's allergies or something, but there has been there's been a lot of coughing and sneezing and wheezing around the seminary. But I said, Lord Jesus, I can't afford to be sick at this time. So you guys keep me in prayer. But it's good to be home. Um, I did Greyhound. I don't know what what, what <laughs> me to do Greyhound, but after a 28 hour journey, I realized we will never. <laughs> that. Again, not even for all nations. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> that had to be a tough ride, uh, oh. Esther. I am sure, but praise God, praise God, you you made it uh, to all nations. I'm sure it was a blessing, and that you made it home. We're praying. I know allergies going around. Darian, I think you're uh, suffering a little bit of allergies. I was for the past couple of weeks. So uh, hopefully, Esther, that's all it is, and it's it's nothing hopefully. more than that, that that you're suffering with. Um, so thank you all. Thank you for being here, um, man. We are going to have just an absolutely fantastic discussion uh, this morning, and so I want to I want to kind of dive right in. Uh, I did want to mention. Uh, I think we had talked about this uh, last week, uh, Gwen. Uh, we know that uh, we you had asked for, well, there was going to be an anointing for Gala. If you could just let us know. Uh, how she's doing, um, you could just uh, drop us a line, drop us an email, and uh, just let us know uh, how she is doing, because we certainly want to uh, keep her in uh, in prayers. Uh, team, uh, we're going to start uh, this morning. Uh, we are in uh, lesson number three. Uh, it's going to be, as I said, a fantastic discussion. We're going to be talking about light shines in the darkness. If this is your first time joining us, we do a keyword and we filter in our conversation this morning through that keyword. Eric, listen, I, I, I am not like Curtis. I can't make it really difficult. I think, Eric, after the first clue and Esther's illustration, people are going to get it. I, I, I don't think it's going to take to the third clue. It's, it's a great keyword and you have great clues. You have great clues. Yeah. Today. 
Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, so I always test it out on Denise first. She got it. Uh, she got it by the third clue. So uh, so I think uh, people are, are, are going to get it. So we're going to start with that. So what we do is we're going to give some clues. Uh, we're going to do the illustration by Esther uh, Rodriguez. Esther, uh, thank you so much for doing the illustration. We're continuing to pray for you and pray for your family. And please, everyone, uh, keep Esther and her family uplifted in, uh, in your prayers. But of course, she came through with just a, a fantastic a fantastic illustration. Um, okay, so here is our first clue for our keyword uh, this morning. This word is used in the Bible to mean, among other things, to be securely determined. Used in the Bible to mean, among other things, to be securely determined. Team, I'm going to ask you to just keep an eye out. Let me know if uh, if we have any winners that come across i'm going to check now i could see some of the some of the guesses are starting to uh to come in all right we have willing we have study we have steadfast we have sealed uh excellent excellent clues all right i'm going to move right into uh esther's illustration because i think this illustration was absolutely Fantastic. So let me find Esther's illustration, make sure I pick the right one. All right. So we see there's a there's a very subtle thing on this picture that I want people to notice. Certainly there is a guard standing uh, in the midst of uh, this, this lightning storm that's going on. He's guarding God's house, God's structure. But notice there is this little flower that is growing uh, and it looks like it's coming right through the concrete that is happening uh, all while all of this turmoil is going on. So uh, just a, just an amazing, amazing uh, illustration, uh, Esther. So thank you. Uh, thank you for that. So that's Esther's illustration. Team, do we have any winners yet? Oh, yeah. Already. We have them on both? Do we have both? Yeah. Oh, we got both already. See, I knew that was going to happen. We got both already. Who do we have, Darren? Who are our, oh, actually, all right. Let me let me reveal first. Let me reveal first. I'm glad we could jump right into it. Let, let me reveal first. Our keyword, our keyword for this morning is steadfast. Steadfast. Darian, who did we have as our uh, winners this morning? Oh, yeah, I think, you, yeah, you I think Lethal I think you was did. first, if I'm not mistaken, okay. on, on uh, Facebook and on uh, YouTube. And this, these came, yeah, Judy Spalding on YouTube. They came very Yay, quickly. Judy, all nations. Wow. There we Fantastic. go. Fantastic. Fantastic. All nations. There you go. So that's perfect. That is perfect. Well, congratulations to our winners. Um, we have, of course, our, our bookmark uh, that we will be sending. If you have if you have won before and you feel so inclined to pass it on to the next person uh, that guest on either YouTube or on Facebook, you can certainly do that. If we don't have your information, please email it to us and we'll make sure that we mail you out one of these fantastic uh, bookmarks. All right, team, steadfast. Here is the definition that I have for the word steadfast. Firmly fixed in place. Firm in belief, determination, or adherence. Team, what do you think of the key word for today, particularly in context of what we are going to be talking about? Darian, let me start with you. Yeah, um, really excited about this particular key word because every force of the enemy is trained against knocking us off against being that person that James talks about that's moving in the in the wave, just to and fro, you know, not being grounded. Um, life circumstances are designed to, well, if it were up to the enemy, our life circumstances, when we're talking about health challenges, we're talking about financial challenges, we're talking about stuff with our children, with our family, they are designed by the enemy. If you have his way, 
for us to be reliant on ourselves and our <clears throat> emotions. And those are swaying to and fro all over the place. So that means that when I hear a good message, come Sabbath, I'm, I'm grounded, so to speak. <clears throat> I'm reading the word. I'm excited about an emotional experience. But then as soon as Sunday hits, as soon as Monday hits, whatever circumstances have me all over the place. But God has called us to utilize those trials and reprogram ourselves, so to speak, such that we realize that he is the rock. And if we are standing mm -hmm. firm in our belief, in our determination, in our adherence uh, to his calling in our lives for us to be the examples, to be that tree planted by the river of life, right? Then steadfastness will be our testimony to everybody else who sees us. Mm -hmm. well, how is it that you are able to, in the midst of all of those challenges, still have a smile on your face and still be praising God and still be in your word? That's what steadfastness is about. And that's what we'll talk about today. Oh, I love that. Darian, I love that. And I love that you hit on the, the testimony that we give in our steadfastness and what that really means. And we're going to look at a couple of stories this morning that are really going to illustrate what that looks like. So uh, just excellent, excellent, Darian. Um, Eric, my brother Eric, what do you think about the key word uh, for this morning? You know, the title of our lesson is um, Light Shines in the Darkness, and it's a very powerful title. And when you think of the word darkness, they're not talking about a physical darkness per se. It is more a spiritual darkness throughout mm -hmm. the land. And, and I believe that we are living in, in, in a season of great darkness, um, spiritual darkness, that is. And if we're going to make it through, we have to be steadfast. We have to understand, um, we have to be firm in belief, determination or adherence with everything that's swirling around us. We must, God is calling us to be steadfast. And, in, and we, have, we need to do some things in order to have this um, element of steadfastness. Mm, I love that, uh, Eric. Do some things. Mm -hmm. the, the steadfastness comes through doing some things, right? And, and, and so that's an important point. Again, things that we're going to touch on this morning as we, as we go through our, our lesson. Esther, Esther, what do you think of our keyword steadfast this morning? I think it's a great description of light. Light mm. is steadfast. Darkness is the absence of light. And so when Jesus said, ye are the light of the world. It also comes embedded with this idea of remaining true and continuing to adhere to him, the true light, the greater light, right? And so for this lesson, having that as an overarching theme, I think helps us to put things together in terms of compromising or not compromising, staying strong, staying steadfast, and allowing the word the word to safeguard because the word, which is also light, is itself steadfast. It mm -hmm. is true. Jesus is steadfast. He is true. And so now he's saying, now abide in me and let my word abide in you. So those two elements are by nature steadfast. And so that's where our strength comes from. And I think it's critical for us to make that connection to the human, because we all know from our experiences that even we can quote the, the Bible, we can quote um, passages and still buckle under sin because it's mm -hmm. not, it, the word has to hook into us. It just can't mm -hmm. be an intellectual ascent. And when it's just an intellectual ascent, we end up like the, the, the sons of Sceva or something like that. And it, it just doesn't work. And for too many of us, we've sort of given up our faith and hope in the, in the power of the word of God. But mm -hmm. hopefully with this lesson, we'll learn the, the needed teachings, the needed lessons that we need to learn regarding how this thing of being steadfast really works. Mm. Well, I, Esther, I love that. Um, in this world where there's so many things that waver, there are so many things that are up and down, things that you really can't rely on, the steadfast things we do have in this world and in this life we find in scripture, in Jesus, in God, there is a steadfastness that we can hold on to that we know is always going to be sure. 
And so it's a beautiful description that you gave because there is certainly an importance to that. All right. So let's get into our memory verse. And as I always like to do, I think we, we try and put the memory verses in context. And so I want to put this memory verse in context. We're going to be in John uh, chapter 12. John chapter 12. Our memory verse is verse number 35. But before we get to that, uh, Eric, I'm going to ask you to give us an idea Certainly for the sake of time, we really want to try and save as much time as we can for conversation this morning. Um, so we're not going to be able to read all of these verses. So, Eric, I'm going to ask you in John chapter 12, in verses 27 through 36, give us an idea of what is taking place in these verses before we hit on verse number 35, which is our memory verse. You know, John 12 is a very exciting <laughs> chapter. Uh, a very dramatic chapter also. And so around uh, verse 27, Jesus, Jesus begins to foretell his death, okay? And as he begins to foretell his death, his soul begins, um, 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 the Bible says his soul became troubled, okay? Mm -hmm. And so he begins to speak to his father, Lord, save me from this hour. And and the, the text says that a voice came out of heaven, okay? Um, um, I'm sorry, he said, Jesus says, Save me from this hour, but may your name be glorified. And then mm -hmm. the voice came out of heaven saying, I have glorified it. And I will do it again. OK. And so all of this um, heavenly voice, voices coming out of heaven, the people standing around him was like, well, you know, what's going on? OK. And they, they, they heard like thunder. They heard they were confused. Um, some of them felt they understood what was going on. But in the midst of all of this, Jesus begins to tell once again that he is going to die. And so then. A little while later, um, they're listening to him. And he says, you know, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. And, and they didn't quite understand what he was talking about. And so in the midst of this confusion, Jesus had to try to bring some clarity about his death and the fact that he is about to go to a cross. Mm, oh, excellent. Excellent recap. And I'm glad that you mentioned that verse, Eric, because I'm going to stay with you and I'm going to ask this question. Because we've heard that a lot. We've heard this verse, which is verse number uh, 32. And so what I'm going to ask you, Eric, is what does Jesus mean in John 12, verse number 32, where he says, and I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. What exactly did Jesus mean when he said that to those that were that were listening to him? Mm -hmm. I believe it's a reference to um, when Moses was in the wilderness when the snakes came out and bit the people and they lifted up this, you had to look at, you had to look up at the, the, um, the, uh, oh, say it, Esther, say it, Esther. I forgot what it's called. Yes. You had yeah. to look up at it to live. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. So Jesus is saying, I'm about to go to Calvary. I'm about to go to the cross and I, I will be lifted up. Okay. And mm -hmm. in order for us to live, we must look and live. And so he's saying, listen, the cross at that time seemed so deadly, so painful, but yet it was going to be glorious is that the cross would draw people to Christ and to be saved. Oh, yeah. Beautiful. Beautiful, uh, Eric. Esther, uh, same question for you if you have maybe a, a different, uh, a, just a different uh, view on it. And Esther, is to tell me if this verse kind of ties along to that, because in 1 Corinthians 2.2, 2, Paul says, for I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Yeah. Talk about that verse, because I, I think as we as we go about our Christian walk and as we go about being witnesses, do we sometimes forget that part of the witnessing when we're reaching people to know nothing except Christ and him crucified? Yeah, it's it, it's. Very, it's a that's a very critical statement that Paul is making, and for a Jewish person to make, because as the people were talking to Jesus in John twelve, they were saying, "What you're saying doesn't make sense. You've been walking around saying that you're the Messiah, and then you're talking about a, a corn and and wheat dying." And so they're like, "No, the, the scriptures say that His kingdom is going to be an everlasting kingdom." 
So they're taking him to Psalms. They're taking him to Isaiah. They're taking him to even Daniel 7. You know, so what are you talking about this thing of the, of the son of man? So they're not understanding. So when he speaks to them again, he's referring back to the same scriptures that they are referring to. So he's all, all of this is densely packed in, in uh, John 12. And so he's dealing with Deuteronomy. He's dealing with Psalms. Mm -hmm. He's dealing with Isaiah, especially Isaiah 42. And he's letting them, he's, he's doing his best to let them know what they already know, but they don't want to see. Mm. And his eye is now on Daniel 9, because when you look, look at John chapter 12, verse 1, it lets you know that we're in the last week of Jesus' life. So this is happening a few days before he goes to the cross. And so his eye is on Daniel 9, the thing that we like to ignore the most, those three score in two weeks in the midst of the week and Messiah's cut off and people are like, what is this talking about? But he's, he's recognizing that the time has come for him mm. to lay down his life. And he's letting them know that they need to be prepared for this. And so they're mm. like, what, what do you mean? What is this talking about? And so his answer is, you know what? Walk in the light mm. while you have it. Mm. You won't have it for long. Mm. And, you know, again, going back to Isaiah, Isaiah 42, it talks about his job, his purpose for coming was to bring the light. And so for them to say, to, for them to look at him and say, we don't understand what you're talking about. And he's saying, I'm right here in front of your face. And mm. I think it's verse 37. It says that he did many miracles in front of them, yet they did not yeah. believe on him. What more could he say after three and a half years mm. and after all of the evidences? What more could he say? What more could he do to, to help them to, to, to put things together? Sometimes, God help us, sometimes we're in the dark because we choose to be in the dark. Sometimes we don't understand mm. because we don't want to know what the truth is. Mm. And Jesus doesn't play games with any of us. I, I that is uh, so powerful, uh, Esther. We we could break all of that down. Uh, you have so much in there, but it's 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 such a a powerful statement to say. You know, Jesus is trying to tell them, "Here's the light. You have the light. I've given you the light. Don't miss the light because the light is not always going to be with you. Pay attention to what I have done. Pay attention to what is going on." So, Darian, as I come to you. Something very interesting, because in verse number 31, it starts just with this one word, now. It's, it's like Jesus is trying to say there is this moment, this is, there is this world-changing event that is going to take place. You're, you're, it's almost like you're asking the wrong question, right, as, as he goes through. So, Darian, just from what, what's taking place, and now kind of make it practical, kind of make it practical for us today as our message goes forward, are we are we kind of missing missing the point sometimes? Are people missing the point? Is our witness missing the point of what we should be focused on today? Um, a, a lot of us get caught up in projecting ourselves onto God. What I mean by that is we think of lists of do's and don'ts. We think of a checklist. Right. And this is what the children of Israel did. This is why Christ had to come, because they thought that if I'm just checking here, checking here, the Pharisees came along and they were so afraid of being plunged back into captivity. They said, let's come up with this list. And as long as we adhere to the list, then we'll be good to go. And that still is something that is very pervasive in our society today and in our church today, where the thought process is let's get caught up in a lot of minutia. And putting people in heaven and hell based on our projection on well, if I were God, then I wouldn't let you in because you're doing X, Y, and Z. And if we are to draw all people to him, right, and reflect that, then we have to say, what is the important thing? It is a relationship. And there are so many. I remember I love, I quoted before, I love how C.D. Brooks would always talk about the three surprises when we get to heaven. First surprise is that we made it. Yeah. 
The second surprise is the people that we thought would be there that are not there. And the third surprise mm. is the people that we would never expect. <laughs> How did you get mm. in here? And you're here. Right? Because <laughs> God sees the heart. David says his, in, in his psalm, he says, search me, O God, and see if there's any wicked way in me. Only God can do that. So I think that when we look at witnessing, we're not looking at, I mean, yes, if I see someone who is doing something that I know is going to be blocking that connection between them and Christ, my encouragement to them is to restore that connection. But I'm looking at it as a testimony. So for example, I know they're watching certain types of content in my life has created a barrier, is allowed the enemy access to me. So if someone talks to me about that, then instead of saying, hey, you know what? Why are you watching that? You're going to hell watching that. I would say, you know what? Uh, I used to be, I used to love that stuff too. And when mm. I watched it, here is what happened to me. Here is how it affected me. I find that when we point people to Christ, instead of to a to-do list, instead of getting caught up in those things, yeah. we are able to draw them through the power of our testimony. Revelation 14, 12. That is the most important thing versus trying to do it the old way with where Christ had to come and say, hey, it's not about this because the Pharisees kept the law better than any one of us. They right. kept the Sabbath better than any one of us, and they missed him when he came. God forbid if we do the same. Oh, uh, beautiful, uh, Darian, beautiful. Uh, just a, a really good practical reminder about, about witnessing and drawing to that that verse that, that Paul says, you know, nothing else, point people to Jesus. That is our, that is our work as disciples, is to point people to to Jesus. Uh, and so here's our here's our memory verse. You guys have already touched on this, on the meaning of this. It's in verse number 35. Then Jesus said to them, a little while longer, the light is with you. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. He who walks in darkness does not know where he is going. So this is going to lead me to my first, our first true, false, somewhat true question of the day. And so Darian, I'm going to stay with you on this one. Tell me if this is true, somewhat true or false. As long as I am reading my Bible and attending church, I will never walk in darkness. Yeah, this is a difficult one because we have to define what does it mean to walk in darkness? Mm. So if we're saying walking in darkness means I'm not hearing God's voice, right? I think it happens to us all the time. I think it's happened. Wait, wait. The possibility is always there for the world to drown out God's voice. No matter how much we're reading the Bible, it is very easy to get caught up in our own issues, our own circumstances. And, you know, there is this prayer shift that we have to engage in. So I would say put that question back up again. Yep. Um, I will say false. I will say false because now, so now if, we're, if we're defining uh, darkness as in being all the way to the other side, <clears throat> right? And I think it's, I think I think there is always a propensity in when I meant when I mentioned the prayer shift, I'm talking about reading Psalms, for example, and we see how David um he expresses what we could define as being in darkness, you know, like like God, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You know, why don't my, my enemies making fun of me? Why am I I feel abandoned? But then by the end of the psalm, you see him being reminded, Oh Lord, you are my rock, you are my salvation, you have been with me in the past, even when it felt like it was dark. So, yes, I would say that reading the Bible, attending church, um, even if it is from a practical standpoint, you're not just doing it to check off a list, even if you are engaged in that thing, there are still some moments where it's going to feel dark. Uh, and then we have to mm. be reminded of about where our light comes from. So I would say false. Okay. Uh, we got a false on that. Uh, excellent. Uh, Darian, my brother, Eric, uh, what do you think? True, somewhat true or false on that question? You know, I read that, um, that question according to John 12 that we just discussed and, um, the people, you know, they were reading their Bibles, but yet they found it difficult to understand that Jesus was talking about his death because they were focused on the scriptures stating that the Messiah would reign, remain forever. And so they missed the scriptures about the death of the Messiah. And so I, I, I believe um, Darian said something about, you know, when we're reading our Bible, we have to make sure that we're hearing the voice of God. And mm -hmm. so you can read your Bible all day long, you can <laughs> attend church all day long, but yet you can be walking in darkness. So I'm going to say false. Okay. All right. We have two, we have two falses. Uh, Esther, uh, same question to you. Are we, are we going for the trifecta this morning? Is that question true, somewhat true, or false? 
I'm going to, I'm struggling with this answer actually, because I'm struggling between the ideal and, you know, God's intention and um, what ends up being the reality for so many of us. Um, but that word never, well, my answer is couched in, notice I'm taking a long way. My answer is couched <laughs> in John 8, verse 12 where Jesus says, I'm the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in mm. darkness. Mm. That's what he says. However, you have, or this question is saying, reading your Bible and attending church. Jesus says, who's following me? Mm. So mm. I can say then that that um, statement is false. So I'm going to rely on what Jesus said in verse 12. He says, mm. He who follows me will not walk mm. in darkness, but will have the light of life. Being tempted is not walking in darkness. Having trials is not walking in darkness. So I think we need to understand that. But Jesus gives a guarantee. If you're following me, I am the light. You won't walk in darkness. And I'm you know, agreeing with everything that has already been said as it relates to recognizing that it's not scripture for scripture's sake. You know, Jesus is the word. So the word is a person. It's not, the word is not what's typed out. The word is a person. Truth is not a set of doctrinal beliefs. Truth is a person. So when it says thy word is a lamp unto my feet, Jesus is the light. He is the lamp to my feet, the light to my path. Like I said earlier, we have so much experience. We try to do what Jesus did when he was tempted. You know, and we try to throw a scripture at the enemy and the enemy is like, what are you talking about? You know, <laughs> so I was like, listen, that whole man shall not live by bread alone stuff doesn't work. <laughs> we, we, but it's a it's because it's not words. It's the word, a person that has to abide mm. in us. And it, that thing is what helps us. The intellectual knowledge does not overrule the flesh. So it is the spirit, <laughs> walk in the spirit. You will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. That's what the scripture is saying. So we mm. have to always connect to the person. So you can read your Bible, but if you're not reading the Bible in connection with the person, if you're not reading it to understand the person, then you're just, you know, doing an exercise in literacy. Mm. Mm. Oh, beautiful, Esther. Uh, great explanation. Uh, it seemed we're, we're all falses. It seems that most of our viewers uh landed on false with that uh with that one as well so uh thank you thank you panel okay um so now we're gonna get into uh two stories uh in in particular um the we're gonna look a little bit at the word compromise the reason why i wanted to talk about compromise and how these stories relate to compromise is for me i think today our churches, when we talk about compromise, only view compromising as a larger thing, as a larger doctrinal uh, difference if we compromise on a major doctrinal difference. When sometimes, and I'll ask this question as we go through the story, when sometimes are smaller compromises an issue for the churches and for our own personal journeys with Jesus? Can smaller compromises be as daunting and dangerous as larger compromises go? So let's get into the story and let's see exactly what, what we can fall on when it comes to compromise. So Esther, we're going to go to Daniel chapter three. Daniel chapter three, and we're going to go through verses one and 12. Again, for the sake of time, we're not going to be able to read all of these verses. So Esther, I'm going to ask you to just kind of give us an overview on what is taking place 
in Daniel chapter three, verses one through 12. You can certainly read some of the verses if you want to. Just give us an idea of what is happening. Before you do that, I have given this a subtitle and I'll explain why and where I got this subtitle from. The subtitle of this is Tie Your Shoe. And we'll get into that in a second. But Esther, tell us what's happening in Daniel chapter three here. Daniel 3 is a continuation of Daniel 2, where Nebuchadnezzar, the king, had a dream and he called all of his wise men to him and said, hey, I had a dream. Tell me what the dream meant. Oh, and by the way, I don't remember what the dream was either. So tell me what it was and then tell me what it meant. And if you don't, then you will die. So Daniel told him what it meant and he was shown a statue and he was shown that a statue that was made of various um, metals from gold to silver to bronze to iron. And he was given the interpretation. He was the head of gold, but it was clear that there were going to be subsequent kingdoms after his. Well, a man with an ego is not going to really <laughs> like that idea. And so Daniel 3, we see the ego at work and he remakes the statue, but instead of having it reflect all of the metals um, that represented the kingdoms that would come after him or his kingdom, he made it all of gold as if to say that he will have an everlasting kingdom. Mm -hmm. And he had the people to bow down to worship. So there was a gathering and the signal was, once you hear the music play, bow down and worship this image. And there were three, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. They did not. They did not bow. And it was told to the king and the king had said, Whoever doesn't bow is going to be sent into this fiery furnace. In other words, you'll be thrown in hell, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. And um, so they were brought to him. He asks them, because these are important people to him, he asks them for their explanation and is willing to give them another chance. But, you know, they said, we're not even going to watch what we say to you at this point. We are going to tell you clearly and directly we are not going to bow. <laughs> so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we're not going to worship this image. We're not worshiping you. We belong to the most high God. And so uh, Nebuchadnezzar got mad, said heat up that, that furnace, and they did heat it up seven times hotter. Those who did that actually got burned. And yeah. when they were thrown in, there was a fourth person with them. Jesus was with them. They did not get burned. And in the end, Nebuchadnezzar worshiped them. Mm. He bowed, you know, and he also testified <laughs> regarding the most high God. So mm. that's mm. Daniel. Mm. Oh, beautiful, Esther. So let me stay with you, Esther, and let me ask, where did these three young men find the strength to not bow when everyone else around them Everyone else around them bows down because they know what the consequences are going to be. Where do these three young men find the strength not to bow? They were under covenant. They found the strength in covenant mm. because they recognized that even though they were in captivity and were under punishment, the covenant was still active. God let them know through Jeremiah that he was still with them. He let them know, you know, Jeremiah 29, 11, you know, we only like verse 11, but that whole chapter, he says, listen, go into Babylon and look, for, work for its success and your own success in Babylon. You'll only be there a short time. You're going to come out. Trust me. I know the plans that I have for you and I'm going to mm. prosper you. So they understood that this was a temporary situation. They were still under covenant. And no matter what happens to you, even if you're dealing with a consequence for your actions, you want to remain on the side of God. You want to remain within the covenant. And mm. that's what they did. So they, they did not just hold to the 10 commandments and to the first commandment or anything like that. They didn't just hold to the words. They held to the person and they recognized the power, the veracity, the the faithfulness of God. And they reflected that back to him. And that's mm. where they were able to have um, that courage. You know, I like your, 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 your words where you said, tie your shoe. They could have faked. Some of us would have faked, you know, mm. we would have 
at you sneezed or which is what I want to do now, or <laughs> they would have tied their shoe or something like that in the hopes that they can escape persecution. But that's mm. a false narrative. We see Nebuchadnezzar always, want, always wants to kill somebody. So you may be safe today, but you're not going to be safe tomorrow. He'll think of some other reason to try to kill people. So they didn't even entertain false narratives of hope. And that's what we have to do because we compromise as a result of a false narrative where we think that there's a loophole and we act accordingly. Mm, oh, beautiful, beautiful, Esther. Darian, uh, Esther really explained uh, the whole the whole tie your shoe uh, narrative. Are we are we guilty uh, in our churches? Because easily, I'm sure they had people around them. I'm sure these three young men had had friends around them that are pulling on their garments that are saying, "Listen, God knows your heart. Just bend down." Fix your sandal, fix your garment, whatever it is. The king will think you're bowing down. We know you're not. God knows, you know, that you're that you belong to him. What's the big deal? At least you're saving yourself persecution. Can we translate that in any way to how our churches are are running today, how our ministries are running? Am I off base here, Darian? Give me your thoughts on that. Yeah, as um, Sabbath keepers, there's a very real practicality in terms of how are we going? Are we going to to conform? You know, um, the world operates. Most of the world operates around Saturdays, especially if you're in business, especially if you're in certain niches. That's a big day, right? And that's a big day, not even just for working, but just for doing things, as for relaxing, us and going out. And so, someone knows. I remember back when I was working before I would work for myself. And uh, I, um, we had a big project that was due. And um, I knew I was, I, I had testimonies of being able to get all of my work done and still taking the Sabbath off. And someone from my job called me on a Saturday and I was like, man, let me just answer the phone one time and make sure everything is okay, right? And and I did that. And when I did that, they're like, oh, I didn't, th the person said, I didn't think you were gonna answer the phone because I know, and I was like, ah. Oh. <laughs> so the compromise, mm. the temptation to compromise is always there. It's saying, well, you know, people will understand. God will understand because I have been entrusted a job. I've been entrusted to be able to provide for my family. So maybe an hour here, maybe the fringes. You know, I think Ellen White talks about guarding the edges of the Sabbath. You know, maybe mm. it's, it's, it's not a big deal if I do this to protect my livelihood, to protect my reputation, and we have to understand that if God has placed us in a position where we have to decide between him and ourselves, the test is to say, hey, are we willing to, as Jesus says, are we willing to sacrifice and put God above family, above work, above children? Or are we going to say, you know what, just this one time. And thankfully, uh, the boys, the Hebrew boys gave us the example, gave us a blueprint to say, it does not matter what people are saying around us. If God wills for me to be humiliated, to be put to death. But if not, I'm still not going mm -hmm. to bow down. I'm still mm -hmm. not going to compromise. Mm -hmm. Beautiful, beautiful, Darian. Eric, uh, as Darian is saying that, and he was talking about that, were these three men in their actions, in their actions of standing, was that a testimony to people around them, maybe that they didn't even know? Is that something that we also need to keep in mind as we go through our Christian walk about the testimony that we give just purely in the things that we the things that we do and that we don't do in this life. No, definitely. Um, the lesson brings out that the word compromise means um, Satan's subtle strategy. And so it's very subtle. And even with this situation that they were going through, that was very subtly designed, just as the music plays, you know, you bow, and they had to be strong, as Esther brings out, in, in knowing a person. And because mm -hmm. they knew a person, they were able to get past Satan's subtle strategy. We need to do the same thing because we're surrounded by these subtle strategies. He comes at us and we're not even expecting him. <clears throat> and if we're not careful, we're going to um, um, submit to his leading. Mm, uh, yeah, absolutely, uh, Eric. Absolutely, to to be aware of that, to discern all of these things that are going on. Team, I'm going to do this. We got to do this as a lightning 
true false is somewhat true because I really want to get into this last story, uh, which I think is going to kind of combine this compromise and this this idea of being steadfast. But here's the question I want to ask, and I'm just going to ask you if you think this statement is true, somewhat true or false. Again, we're going to do this as a lightning round. If unity could be secured only by the compromise of truth and righteousness, then let there be difference and even war. Is that statement true, somewhat true, or false? Eric, I'm going to stay with you on that one. I'm going to say false. I'm going to say false. We need um, we need true, we need to build on a firm foundation. And if you secure something by a compromise, you're not going to have a firm foundation. And it may look like it's successful, but in the end, it will fall. I think you're saying true on that, Eric, aren't you? I think you're saying true that that. If if it's compromise, if we need to compromise truth and righteousness, then we're not going to do it. So I think you're saying true yeah. with that statement. True. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're saying true with that. Okay. All right. Cool. Cool. Esther, uh, same question to you. Um, true. True. Is my okay. mic on? Yeah. Um. Uh, then yeah. True. True. All right. That's light. That's lightning. That's that's lightning. Esther's holding true to that. My brother Darian, same question. Absolutely. The foundation is not firm. Uh, one compromise will lead to another, lead to another. We cannot build, we cannot use the enemy's weapons. Uh, lying is the enemy's native language, according to John 8 44. So, mm. absolutely. Mm. Yeah, I, I love that compromise. And remember, the author is not saying compromise on a large scale, compromise on a small scale. It is any compromise that is against truth and righteousness according to God's word, according to his plan. Forget it. If it's going to cost that, then let there be differences and let there be war. We need to stand on that. So thank you, team. All right. So we're going to close out. We only have about nine minutes left or so. Um, being steadfast. What does being steadfast look like uh, in the face of all of these things that are coming at us? So uh, Darian, I'm glad I found out as I was doing the outline this week, I found out that this is one of Darian's favorite stories in the Bible. So this worked out perfectly because Darian in uh, 1 Kings in chapter 22, there is uh, something that's happening that is going to lead into someone else needing to make a decision about either being steadfast or compromising. So Darian, 1 Kings chapter 22, verses 1 through 12. We're going to then read verses 13 and 14. But give us a background on what's happening uh, in these first 12 verses. Sure. Evil King Ahab has gotten a victory over Syria because God was trying to make an example. God was trying to show to unbelievers uh, what happens when we trust in God. And uh, Ahab compromised and let the king Benadad go free. And he's even escorated by a prophet for doing so. Uh, and, and Benadad promised to give back some of the cities that he had captured uh, in the past. Uh, but by this chapter here, he is not fulfilled his promise. And Ramoth Gilead still belongs to the Syrians. And so Ahab is upset about it. And uh, he goes to the king of, of Judah, who Jehoshaphat, who was a good king, but his daughter is about to marry Ahab's son. Well, I think it's the other way around. It, their, their children are about to get married, which is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. a whole other story about mm -hmm. compromise. But here it is. Jehoshaphat is called in for assistance. And Jehoshaphat has no business making this alliance with evil King Ahab, but he does have the wherewithal to say, hey, let's ask God for help. Let's see if, if he is going to be with us. And Ahab trots out these 400 so-called prophets of God and say, hey, should we go up to Ramoth Gilead where we have victory? And they just all parrot the same answer. Yes, God will be with you. Go ahead and do your thing. And Jehoshaphat knows, he smells a rat. He's like, I, I, I know how you guys are. There's not a single king of Israel after King Solomon, who was a good king. When the kingdom split, they were all evil. He was like, I know how you kings are. I remember Jeroboam, how he basically made anybody a prophet, anybody who wanted to be a priest, go ahead and rubber stamp them. So let me get some real confirmation. I need somebody who's, you know, somebody who's got a beard, somebody who is kind of rough around the edges, going to give some hard answers, not what these people are doing. And so that's kind of where we find ourselves now, where uh, someone, Micaiah, 
who has been known for being steadfast, who's been known to not compromise, he was the one who was called in. The fact that Ahab acknowledges he does not like this brother. So like every time I call him, he has something negative to say. He has something that bristles me, that pricks my conscience, that makes me do something uncomfortable. And, and Jehoshaphat's like, that's the brother we need to get. Let's bring him in here. Let's see what he has to say. And I don't know how far you want me to go with that background. Uh, but Micaiah is the one who is in a position to either go along with the crowd. Matter of fact, when he is brought out of prison, he is told, hey, all these other people have said that uh, Jehovah is with the people. So just make your word, just play ball and everything can go, can go well. Yeah, that, that's that's beautiful. A beautiful, beautiful uh, synopsis there, Darian, because that's the important part, right? You had these 400 so-called prophets that come out. They say go to do it. They know about this Micaiah. They, the, the king Ahab knows about this Micaiah, doesn't like him. I don't like this guy at all because he always goes against me, which should be the, the telltale sign. But then they go to Micaiah and they say to Micaiah, do us a favor almost. Just don't be that guy. <laughs> be like all the rest of them. Don't be that guy. Just do it. Verse 13 then picks up and it says, then the messenger who had gone to call Micaiah spoke to him saying, now listen, the words of the prophets with one accord encourage the king. Please let your word be like the word of the one of them and speak encouragement. In verse 14, it says, and Micaiah said, as the Lord lives, whatever the Lord says to me, that I will speak. Darian, I'm going to stay with you. The same thing that we asked about with these three Hebrew boys. Why was Micaiah, knowing full well what was probably going to happen to him, why was he able to stand so firm in, be steadfast in that moment? Yeah, anybody who lived in the time of Ahab, anybody who was serving God, understood how far off the mark Ahab and Jezebel had brought God's people. Now, they had lived during the time, uh, many of them had lived during the time of Elijah, where thousands of prophets had been put to death. And so the ones that were still around, that had been in hiding, had been, you know, or in prison, they understood that there was going to be a consequence. But they also realized me compromising is going to make things worse for God's people. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, it's going to plunge people worse into idolatry. So there was not a benefit. There may have been a short term benefit. People liked idolatry because it meant eating all this crazy food and meant orgies and it meant all this fun stuff in the eyes of people looking for short term appetite satisfaction. But at this point, it's kind of this thing like when you are a veteran, when you're someone who's in battle after a month, after a couple of months, you are either dead or you are just like very good at your craft. So these individuals who had been standing strong, they said, hey, there is no value for me to go against what I've been doing, right? If I compromise now, then everything that I did to this point is for naught. Me being in prison, me being beat up, being whatever the case may be, there is no value for me to change now, mm -hmm. right? It's not going to allow me to have any stronger impact on God's people. So I believe his, Micaiah's mindset was, if I'm staying steadfast to what God has called me to do, then maybe somehow God can use my steadfastness to save this people and to bring them back mm -hmm. to where they are serving God again. That was the ultimate goal. It's not my comfort, not me eating some fancy food because mm -hmm. they have said, give this brother bread and water. It's saying maybe the next generation or future generations will finally get back to serving God. Oh, I love that. Uh, I love that. Darian and, and Eric, it kind of leads to this other point. Micaiah's reputation preceded him because Ahab knew because of how Micaiah had been in the past, Ahab knew what this guy was all about. And so do we hope for the same in our walk that our reputation precedes us that man, like I know if I need somebody deep to pray with or to come with some kind of a spiritual attack that I am under, I know I can reach out to Darian. I know I can reach out to Esther or Eric. Does that matter? Practically, does that matter in today's in today's time? Eric, you're, you're muted. You're muted, brother. It definitely matters. Um, it, it's so powerful that that Ahab knew. Ahab knew. Listen, he's not in my back pocket. 
And that is so important, even in leadership in today's churches. We need to have, be um, leaders or members that will tell the truth. And people should mm. know our reputation should precede us, that, that this person will tell us the truth, even though it hurts. And, and, and our churches today, I, I feel that they need these type of individuals to stand firm and to speak the truth in love. And just and, and listen, if there are Ahab saying, listen, you know, he ain't with me, then, then so be it. It's, it's, too, it's mm. too unfortunate. Yeah, excellent, excellent point. Esther, uh, we only have a few minutes left. Darren, I know you got stuff to do if you got to jump off. Uh, totally, totally get it. Uh, but Esther, I want to get your thoughts, particularly on the leadership part. Um, it's tough today because we are about compromise. I mean, let's be honest. We're about compromising by allowing some worldly things to come in to kind of make our churches a little bit more appealing. Uh, you know, that's just the, the reality. The, the leadership, those that stand in the position of, of decision making for the flock, for the churches, do we, can we gain something from this story about Makai, about being steadfast and always reflecting the light of Jesus? Yes. Um, and it's very interesting as you as you continue reading this story about Micaiah, Micaiah does what they asked him to do. He, you know, he gives them a good report. He's yes, um, go, go, and God will prosper you. Uh-huh, you'll win. Yes. Mm -hmm. So he tells the party line, but they don't fall for it. They're like, listen, didn't I tell you that you're supposed to always tell me the truth? This is so ridiculous, right? <laughs> And so he tells them the truth and then gets in trouble for it, you know? And so the king is like, listen, if I don't come back alive, you know, keep him in jail until I come back alive. And, and Makai said, if you come back alive, then I'm not a prophet, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so it, it doesn't work. It doesn't pay to, to toe the party line. We have to be faithful. And again, when your reputation proceeds, even when we give people what they want, they know that we're being, you know, that we're messing with them or, or what have you. Uh, it is for us to not be moved by man's consequences. Con reward is a motivator. Consequences is also a motivator. You know, we're motivated by fear. We're motivated by reward. But... Um, the, the people of God are not to be motivated by fear. You know, it's fear God. You know, don't look for any reward from the enemy. Don't run away from any consequence that the enemy gives. You know, we are to fear God. We are to respect God. We are to look for his um, rewards. But we're also to not want his consequences which go far and beyond any yeah. consequence that the enemy can conjure up. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it, what is going to motivate? What are we motivated by? Well, that's not yeah. gotta eat. Well, Phil, we have to live. Well, Eric, we have to save life. And we come up with all of these reasons why we need to compromise. And my thing is, don't say it to me. <laughs> Tell that to God, Amen. you know? Where do we see compromising working for the people of God? Amen. Amen. Beautiful. Uh, beautiful, Esther. Uh, Darian had to uh, jump off. I uh, just want to thank Darian for uh, for being with us today. Team, uh, we're going to close out. Um, here's the question. How can we ensure that light is today shining in darkness? How, how can we be sure of that? And I want to read this uh, this quotation uh, then we're going to end. And, and Eric, I'm going to ask you to uh, to close this out in prayer. And this is what uh, the quote, this was written in, in 1894. Uh, but I think it's very, I think it's very uh, um, apropos to today. And it says, it is a grave mistake on the part of those who are children of God to seek to bridge the gulf that separates the children of light from the children of darkness by yielding principle by compromising the truth, then let the followers of Christ settle it in their minds that they will never compromise truth, never yield one iota of principle for the favor of the world. Let them hold to the peace of Christ. And that was in a, a journal 
the Review and Herald, July 24th, 1894. Uh, Eric, uh, Esther, I'm going to just ask you very, very briefly uh, for your your final thoughts uh, this morning. Eric, let me let me start with you. You know, we just need to be true to, to the Lord. We need to draw close to a person. Um, like we, we've been saying for the whole hour, um, know the person and know the doctrines that that point us to the person. And mm. once we do that, we can be true to him and true to what he has called us to be. Because there's darkness all around us. And we want, when the darkness is, is, is dissipated, we want to be standing, standing firm in a person. Amen, amen, amen. Esther, uh, your, final, your final thoughts this morning. In one of the Bible studies, um, we deal with um, situational ethics, right? Because we can talk such great talk in our Bible mm. discussions, right, <laughs> about compromising and standing true. So I gave a scenario, and this this happened to a real person. You're, you know, missionary, uh, spreading the word of God in a country where it's not really altogether legal, like, a, let's say, a communist country. And so um, the punishment is death if you're caught doing X, Y, Z. So the person is detained, but they're detained on false charges, actually. And, and they're going to be executed as a result. Mm. But the guard knows and understands that they're being falsely accused and so um, gets false documents and false documentations to give to them, which will enable them to escape under those circumstances, would it be right mm. to take those papers and be able to have your escape so that you can continue doing the work of God? Mm. And the reasons and rationales fly left and right. And I would encourage our viewers to actually um, think that through and talk about it um, today yeah. with, with um, those around you and see where you land. Because again, you know, there's the Bible and then there's the living Bible that you and I are. What do you do with all of these different situations? So it's mm. important for us to have these conversations, but then at some point it has to get real. At some point we then now have to do a survey in our own lives. Um, when have I compromised, you know, yeah. as, you know, single people, we're always, faced with compromises. Oh my word. So we, we need to be mindful and aware of, of what is being put before us and what, wow. what loyalty to God means and looks like. Mm, mm, yeah. Uh, wow. Uh, yeah, definitely something to, uh, to discuss. And I, I like how that ending, you had that there as to what does loyalty to God look like? And uh, again, in this dark time, in this dark period of time that we're in, we're called to be light bearers. We're called to reflect the light of Jesus. And uh, so how do we remain steadfast? So Eric, as you close us in prayer, I, I want you to pray with whatever is on your heart. But as, as we talk about compromise and being steadfast, uh, we just pray that everyone is able to, to remain steadfast in the gospel, in their relationship with Jesus because we want to be that witness to those that are around us. So Eric, uh, please, please close us out with prayer. Gracious Father, Lord, we just come praising you and lifting you up this morning. Lord, we thank you that you have called us to be our, your sons and daughters. And Lord, we want to represent you the way that we should. Lord, draw close to us and may we draw close to you. Yes. And may, we, may you put in our hearts a spirit of steadfastness so that we will be standing true like the Hebrew boys Mm -hmm. the plane of Durham. Lord, bless us, we pray. Lord, we uplift Gala today. We uplift yes, her and yes, for her Lord. surgery on the 17th. Lord, you mm -hmm. are an awesome healer. We ask that you just go by her bedside, bless her and her family. Um, bless Sister Butler. Bless the entire family during this time. Lord, yeah. we are praising you right now for a good report. Be with us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Esther. Thank you all for hanging in there. I know we ran a little over. Uh, panel, thank you. Uh, thank you guys so much for today. And thank all of you. Have a great, great Sabbath day. And we will see you next week one more time on Hit the Mark. Have a great day, everyone.